All righty. It looks like we're just at four o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. I am Shannon Clifford, and I am honored to be the executive director of the Mesa Verde Foundation. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that we do to support Mesa Verde National Park. I also want to just take a second to introduce Monica Buckle. She doesn't get nearly as much praise as she really deserves for hosting these wonderful webinars. Um, we just could not do it without her. So that being said, I am going to hand it off to Monica. Thank you, Monica. Oh, well, thank you, Shannon, so much. That was a lovely introduction. And I just wanna thank everyone for being so patient. We live in this virtual era, so all kinds of things can happen and unexpected glitches. So we appreciate your patience. So good afternoon and happy May. Thank you for joining the Mesa Verde Foundation. Shannon did my introduction and I serve on the foundation's board of directors and I will be moderating today's event. We are most fortunate to have Dr. Andrew Gulliford presenting. Dr. Gulliford is a professor of history and environmental science at Fort Lewis College and is a Mesa Verde Foundation board member. Using rare historic postcards, Dr. Gulliford will present a visual history of Mesa Verde National Park. The historic postcards in the presentation are from the Fort Lewis College collection and are available to the public for research purposes. On a personal note, when Andy and I were discussing the webinar, above his stellar career, life's work, and achievements, he wanted me to mention that Fort Lewis College offers free tuition for Native American and Alaska Native students. The college graduates more Native students than any other educational institution. Andy is committed to Native and Indigenous peoples and wrote one of my favorite books within this focus, Sacred Objects and Sacred Places, Preserving Tribal Traditions. The Mesa Verde Foundation is the official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. As a foundation, we secure funding for the park's capital improvements, special projects, and further promote understanding and preservation for ancestral Puebloan culture. The foundation is currently hosting a virtual auction. An exclusive auction item is a three-day backcountry ancestral Puebloan Bears Ears National Monument Tour, led by none other than Dr. Gilliford. Guests on the tour will see rare cliff dwellings and a variety of ancient rock art. Bears Ears is the northwest edge of the ancestral Puebloan world, and Mesa Verde and pottery has been found in many sites. Guests will discover a clear link to Mesa Verde style kivas, masonry, and rock art. Ancestral Puebloan clans and families who lived at Mesa Verde also established farming plots, villages, and cliff dwellings in the Bears Ears region. Dr. Gulliford has previously led American West backcountry and river trips for the Smithsonian Institution, National Geographic Society, and PBS to name a few. This once in a lifetime tour is for up to eight guests. Visit our virtual auction via the link in the chat box. The auction ends this Sunday. While we're on the subject of tours, this October, the foundation is hosting a three day, four night, behind the scenes VIP fall tour at the park. Dr. Gulliford will be conducting the tour along with the renowned Zuni basket maker, Christopher Lewis. As a group, we will explore Mesa Verde, speak to park specialists and have an evening reception at the park superintendent's home. Tour information and registration is in the chat box. With the utmost gratitude, I'd like to thank the park superintendent, Cliff Spencer for his support and our amazing board of directors. Our public programming is possible solely from donations and the support of Mesa Verde Foundation fellows and members like you. We thank you for creating space for this webinar offering. I would also like to acknowledge the tremendous support of Northern Arizona University at Flagstaff and Fort Lewis College in Durango and their inspiring students and staff in attendance today. Now, circling back to our guest speaker. 
Dr. Guilliford has written many books and has been the recipient of the Colorado Book Award on numerous occasions, as well as Arizona Book Awards and New Mexico Book Awards. Dr. Guilliford was awarded the National Individual Volunteer Award from the U.S. Forest Service for outstanding contributions to America's natural and cultural resources. He writes a weekly column about the Southwest for the Durango Herald, which he has done for the past 15 years. His latest book about Bears Ears National Monument will be published later this year. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. So if you could kindly hold them, that would be most appreciated. I would now like to welcome Andy. Well, Monica, thank you very much. Uh, Shannon, thank you. Um, if everybody can hear me, I'll, I'll go ahead and begin. How's the audio? You sound wonderful. Okay, good. So I, I wanna dedicate this talk to Peter P. Pino from Zia Pueblo. Uh, he and I led tours together for three years at Mesa Verde and um, he, he passed away uh, last year um, from COVID. And uh, he was just an inspiration to many, many people, both at Mesa Verde and also at uh, Crow Canyon uh, Archaeological Center. So yes, I've led tours uh, for the Smithsonian, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and National Geographic. One of my favorite places is Mesa Verde. So I'm gonna talk about Mesa Verde for 20 or 30 minutes. And then we're gonna see this really fun uh, list of postcards, historic postcards, beginning with some of the oldest and then coming up to some of the newest. Um, the students I teach, it, it's a little hard to say this, but a lot of them were actually born in the 21st century. And so I have to explain to them what a postcard is. They they know email, they know texting. Uh, they're not used to getting postcards from their grandmothers and, and, uh, and yet that's how people communicate. So it'll be fun to look at those postcards. For those of you who have not been to Mesa Verde, I would urge you to come. For those of you who have been to Mesa Verde, but you were children, come on back. Uh, there's been a lot of changes and yet you will absolutely remember the place. Uh, in 2006, I was a series editor for seven new books on Mesa Verde for the 100th birthday. And I'll talk a little about those, but I also wanna begin with the two most frequently asked questions about Mesa Verde. So here you go. These are the questions the Rangers get all the time. So the first one, why are the cliff dwellings so far from the road? And the second one, how many undiscovered cliff dwellings are there? So you, you, you've gotta love the, the tourists who ask those questions. And what are your Mesa Verde memories? When did you visit the park? Hopefully on our uh, Mesa Verde Foundation website, we can do more with that. I'd love to have a link for people to put on their Mesa Verde memories because uh, for many people, it goes back decades. And yet for young children, it's uh, something, hopefully they'll do this summer. So Mesa Verde is discovered um, for the Anglo world anyway, by Richard Wetherill and Charlie Mason in December of 1888. They are riding uh, the Mesa looking for cows. They have permission to do that from the Utes. They're actually on the Ute Indian Reservation. It had just begun to snow. They're on a ridge and I think I know exactly where they were and they look across and they see what they will name as Cliff Palace. Willa Cather fictionalized that moment in her book uh, the Professor's House in 1925. She was a very good writer, one of the first real um, Southwestern women writers. So let me read what she wrote about that magic moment and what it would have been like. So she fictionalized what actually happened with Richard Wetherill and Charlie Mason. It was such rough scrambling that I was soon in a warm sweat under my damp clothes and stopping to take a breath. I happened to glance up at the canyon wall. I wish I could tell you what I saw there, just as I saw it on that first morning through a veil of lightly falling snow, far up above me, a thousand feet or so, set in a great cavern in the face of the cliff. I saw a little city of stone asleep. It was as still as sculpture and something like that. It all hung together, seemed to have a kind of composition, 
pale little houses of stone nestling close to one another, perched on top of each other with flat roofs, narrow windows, straight walls, and in the middle of the group, a round tower. It was beautifully proportioned, that tower, swelling out to a larger girth, a little above the base, then growing slender again. There was something symmetrical and powerful about the swell of the masonry. The tower was the fine thing that held all the jumble of houses together. It made them mean something. It was red in color, even on that gray day. In sunlight, it was the color of winter oak leaves. A fringe of cedars grew along the edge of the cavern, like a garden. They were the only living things. Such silence and stillness and repose, immortal repose. That village sat looking down into the canyon with the calmness of eternity. The falling snowflakes sprinkling the pinyons gave it a special kind of solemnity. I can't describe it. It was more like sculpture than anything else. I knew at once that I had come upon the city of some extinct civilization, hidden away in this inaccessible mesa for centuries, preserved in the dry air and almost perpetual sunlight like a fly in amber, guarded by the cliffs and the river and the desert. So that's Willa Cather's description of Richard Wetherill's discovery of Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde would then go on to be made famous um, not only by Richard Wetherill, but by two women. And this is a great story that uh, perhaps we can cover in more detail on another event. But two women uh, really worked together to put together the national park, although they had a disagreement, a serious disagreement over whether it should be a national park or a state park. And um, that, that's a great story. It's in one of our books published by the Durango Herald Small Press called Women to the Rescue. And uh, luckily the woman who won out was the woman who wanted it to be a national park. New research on the Wetherills. Uh, we published in a book called The Wetherills, Friends of Mesa Verde. And uh, Richard Wetherill is a controversial figure because in, some people consider him a pot hunter, others, others consider him a, a scholar, although he had no academic training. But I think it's important that his father, B.K. Wetherill, had actually written the Smithsonian. And he wrote, quote, I think the Mancus and Tributary Canyon should be reserved as a national park in order to preserve the curious cliff houses. The country is exceedingly rough and of no earthly use except for the curiosities. So the Wetherill legend is still in play and uh, love to talk about that in more detail. We do have a large Wetherill archive at Canyons of the Ancients National Monument, which uh, when you're standing on the, on the front steps, you look straight across at Mesa Verde. It's a Bureau of Land Management mon monument with a lot of Mesa Verde connections. And then there's Gustav Nordenschuld, uh, a young Finn who comes out to Mesa Verde, is guided by the Wetherills, does the first excavation as a scientist, takes valuable photographs. Some of his numbering in black paint on kivas and rooms is still seen today. And I think I have some photos that I'll be able to show you of those. Yes, he dug sites at Mesa Verde without a permit. It wasn't a national park yet. Local Durango uh, socialites were very resentful of this European taking American artifacts. And uh, I like to say that we have here in Durango, Colorado, uppity women. Uh, we certainly had them in the 19th century. I'm glad they're here today. Well, they had Nordenschuld arrested uh, because he was taking boxes and boxes of Mesa Verde artifacts back to Finland. He was held under arrest at the Strader Hotel, one of our great hotels here in Durango, and he sent home a very famous telegram. Now, I know our executive director, Shannon, is a mother. Hopefully, many of you uh, listening are parents. So you can imagine getting this telegram that went all the way back to Finland from uh, Durango, Colorado, six words, really famous words, and imagine getting something like this from your child 3,000 miles away. Here are the words, much trouble, some expense, no danger. Um, that's what he sent home. Uh, but when it came to his court date, his lawyer went to the bench and said, your honor, what law has my client broken? And there wasn't one. 
So Nordenschuld was able to take his crates of artifacts and human remains, I want to mention that, back to, to uh, Finland, uh, where they have been in the National Museum in Helsinki. And that helped spur the two women to start a movement to create Mesa Verde as a national park. It also helped spur the Antiquities Act. And there are many uh, ancestral Puebloan sites that are preserved as national monuments. Chaco Canyon, Aztec National Monument. Uh, Chaco Canyon is a national park, began as a national monument. But that law, the Antiquities Act, was signed by President Theodore Roosevelt the same month he created Mesa Verde as the world's first cultural park. So many first things happened in Mesa Verde. Um, even getting there was a challenge. And so those of us in Colorado know that uh, the, the beautiful but difficult Wolf Creek Pass, US Highway 160, um, that was in part created to get tourists to Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde had the first campground the first museum, the first campfire talks. Uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps had a unit at Mesa Verde. Some of their buildings are still there. Certainly their handiwork is still there. Uh, another really important piece of research by Kathleen Fierro has to do with stabilization in the park. That's a book called Dirt, Water, Stone, and the work she did for years with skilled Navajo Mason. Masons. New uh, research on associated sites includes Chimney Rocks and the Lunar Standstill. Chimney Rocks is east of, east of Mesa Verde, oh, 40 miles or so. Uh, the Lunar Standstill occurs there every 17.6 years. So if you've missed it, um, come on down and uh, definitely be here. The moon stops between two chimneys of rock. That was also an ancestral Puebloan site, and uh, those folks would have known about peoples at Mesa Verde. So research goes on with the ancestral Puebloans, certainly at Canyons of the Ancients National Monument, now at the new Bears Ears National Monument, and at the Visitor and Research Center, which holds almost 3 million artifacts of all sorts of different rare objects, which we get to see. Uh, we do a backroom tour uh, when we do the Mesa Verde tour. But one particular set of objects that are really fun to look at are jewelry collected by Mary Coulter. So Mary Coulter was a premier, uh, very important female Southwestern architect in a time when there were very few such women architects. She designed buildings at the Grand Canyon, hotels. She worked for the Santa Fe Railroad. She received a, a regular check for travel uh, reimbursement and she spent it all on jewelry and she gave her jewelry collection to Mesa Verde. In fact, at the Grand Canyon, um, the tower called um, the Watchtower was actually inspired by towers at Mesa Verde. People don't know that when they visit the Grand Canyon. So who were the ancestral Puebloans? Well, we're not sure what they called themselves. They arrived in the Four Corners in the year one. They were gone by 1300 AD. They were farmers. How many people were there in, at Mesa Verde and in the larger Montezuma County, which now includes Colorado? Possibly 25,000 people. Well, there's 19,000 people in the county today. So that means that over the time when Mesa Verde was a thriving native community, uh, there were more, more indigenous people in Montezuma County than live here today. In Spanish, Mesa Verde means green table. And why they were up there instead of down in the river bottom has to do with the soil. So yes, they knew where the Mancus River was. Yes, they used it for water, but they farmed on top of the Mesa because of the soil, which had blown in over hundreds of thousands of years. From pit houses, they developed incredible cliff dwelling architecture, uh, an astounding black on white uh, ceramic style. Their food was diverse with eating pinon nuts, yucca fruit, berries, other wild plants. They created water catchments and reservoirs. We could almost do a whole tour at Mesa Verde just on water and how they used it, where they got it, uh, how they saved it. Uh, they hunted deer, antelope, and bighorn sheep. Uh, turkeys were penned and uh, used for turkey feather blankets. We've got great new research 
on turkey feather blankets. Uh, in fact, there's a woman with the New Mexico uh, uh, Cultural Center, uh, Mary Wiaki, who just did a new turkey feather blanket. We think it's the first turkey feather blanket in 800 years. It took 17,000 feathers. Uh, what a lot of work. And uh, we've got some great pictures of that. They moved into the cliffs uh, by the 1200s. They were gone by 1300. So the Mesa Verde world is intensive. It includes from the Pueblo uh, II period, Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde folks were there through the whole Pueblo time sequence. Um, and then adjacent Yucca House. One of the great things that's happened recently is a donor has provided additional private property next to Yucca House. Yucca House has been very hard to access and Cliff Spencer, the superintendent has really helped with that. And we hope to have better parking and better access. Yucca House is so big that when you go up to it and you're on it and you're in the site, it doesn't look like anything until you start to look. And then you realize that everything you're looking at is a site. It is a huge unexcavated town. And uh, it's great that we're finally gonna be able to do some Yucca House tours on a regular basis. Ancestral Puebloans depended upon a diet of corn. They may have eaten maybe 70% of their diet was corn. Well, that doesn't provide enough proteins and amino acids. So they would have had trouble with arthritis in their teeth. The corn they ate would have been ground with a um, mano, which is Spanish for hand, on a matate or a hard surface. By eating corn ground with stones, they wound up eating little pieces of stone, which damaged their teeth. So infections could have come into their body from their mouths. So they didn't live that long. And um, it, was a, it was a difficult life. By the mid 1200s, there are definitely defensive building strategies. One of my favorite tours is a balcony house built in 1240 based on the tree ring dates, remodeled in 1270 with additional walls and narrow access routes. Uh, when you do the balcony house tour, the way the park service has you do it is the opposite of the way they entered it. So just be aware of that. You, you climb up a ladder, you're on the balcony, you go out through a tunnel. That's the reverse of how the Mesa Verdeans did it when they did their, their final remodel in 1270. So it was all about defense, defensive architecture and what that meant. By 1300, they were gone. The whole four corners was empty. Only wind blew through the vast ruins, only moonlight entered the sandstone doorways. Now we are learning so much more, not only because of archeology, span but because of an affiliation with the tribes. 24 different tribes have a cultural affiliation with uh, Mesa Verde. Uh, I teach a lot of their, their children and grandchildren at Fort Lewis College. I learn a lot from my students. And from the native perspective, it's not just new research what's important. It's also honoring the dead. So one of the really important things that has happened in the last few months is the return of human remains excavated by Norton Schuld and the Wetherills, dug up in 1891, and finally returned to Mesa Verde in the fall of 2020. 20 ancestral Puebloans and 28 funerary objects were reburied in a quiet private ceremony at the National Park. And, and the Mesa Verde Foundation helped raise funds for that. The, the affiliated tribes observed four days of official mourning after the reburial. The cycle of life, death, and interment now has been allowed to continue. Quote, our hearts are happy that our ancestors have made their journey home and are at rest where they belong, stated Frederick Medina, governor of the Pueblo of Zia, where where Peter Pino uh, was also governor at one time. And the Zunis also said, quote, as their descendants, the Ashiwi continue to practice the shared Puebloan values and ways of life to this day, even as modern day boundaries and jurisdictions disrupt our dedication through our age old prayers, we have realized this event. In doing so, we honor their vision and intent to share resources, blood and resiliency. Balancoa. 
So that's part of what the Mesa Verde Foundation does. We help the park with uh, whatever we can. And uh, now um, let's, uh, let's see some postcards. So Monica's gonna help with this. We're gonna- uh, Absolutely. Gonna... Okay, just um, let me know. I'm about to share the screen. Okay. And pull up the presentation. Okay. All right. So this is just a lot of fun. And I'm gonna, when it's time to, to change the postcard, I'll say next and Monica will move to the next postcard. But we have a lot of these. We, I think we have the largest Mesa Verde postcard collection in the world. We have a donor who uh, just eagerly follows eBay and finds us uh, postcards. And, and so we have a huge collection. Students have written their senior theses based on this collection. Other researchers can access these, access these via the web. And Mesa Verde Park Rangers. Mesa Verde has a large number of park rangers for the size of the park. So even though the park is only about 60,000 acres, we have far more park rangers than other parks because of the need for interpretation and the need for supervision. And so when those park rangers are getting ready for their season, they have a few hours where they can study and, and they come to Fort Lewis College and they have fun looking at these postcards too. Next. Monica, can we go to the, there we go. So uh, these are fun. These, these were black and white images that were then hand tinted. Uh, this is the original sort of drive up to the park and that butte, uh, which is very important. Uh, and today's visitor center is just under it. Next. So some of these postcards are valuable because they show the, dwelling sites before any stabilization. And uh, we have dates on these. We know when they were mailed to other people. So uh, they're really useful for research. Uh, this must be Square Tower House. Look all the way up into the corner and see some of that building way up in the, in the kind of right-hand corner of the postcard. So pretty valuable because this is what it was like in the early 1900s. Next. Uh, you can't do this anymore. We don't want you sitting on walls or standing on walls, but uh, this is an unstabilized cliff palace. And these are really valuable historic artifacts. Next. Uh, you cannot stand on the balcony uh, at Balcony House, but it's still there. And you'll see some modern pictures of it here before we're through. Next. So this is interesting. So I think the photograph is original. I think the woman was sort of hand drawn in, but it's a good image of Balcony House. And I've always wondered why the, the little wall, very important so you don't fall off the edge. So I, I wonder if this was some sort of kindergarten or place, safer place for ancestral Pueblo and children. Uh, just don't know. Next. This is interesting. So Spruce Tree House, but notice the paint on the wall. So right in the middle of the, of the postcard, uh, the woman with the white blouse and the skirt, look above, that's original paint. And um, I think it's, it's still there. I've got, I've got uh, color uh, photographs of that. Next. What an amazing place. Now, this is interesting. Also, look above the woman with the wearing the tie, pretty fancily dressed. Look at her hat, but look at it. But look above. Uh, see the sort of shadow images there. Yeah, very good. Um, that could be paint. That could be where the wall was filled in. Um, you know, my wife wants to redo the kitchen. There were Mesa Verdean wives who I think had the same idea. Next. Oh, it is so great now to finally have the Visitor and Research Center. 
And uh, when we do the Mesa Verde tour, uh, we work out uh, time with the, the uh, curator, the, the director, and she is always so grateful uh, that we're there and, and you know, gracious to, to let us in. Um, we have, uh, the park has some of these corrugated bowls that actually have the original pot rests um, made of yucca uh, to keep them flat. Next, another cliff dwelling, or I'm sorry, cliff palace image. Next. It is just amazing to see this change over time. As the walls got stabilized, realize that in 1906, not only is Mesa Verde one of the first national parks, but the whole idea of respecting and appreciating native culture it was just at the very beginning. Uh, racism was alive and well. And, um, you know, New Mexico and Arizona do not become states until 1912. Think about that. Um, and, and partly because of so many Catholics and so many, you know, Native peoples and Hispanic peoples. So Mesa Verde has played a very important role in educating Americans and international visitors about this really important heritage. And uh, Edgar Hewitt actually uh, said in, in writing that it was the ancient heritage of New Mexico, which helped uh, New Mexico become a state. Next. All right, here we go. Cedar Tree Tower. This is a different kind of masonry. Uh, the towers of Mesa Verde would make their own little great talk and um, certainly tour. Uh, some of these are in remote places. Some of them uh, we can easily access. Not sure what their purpose was, but they appeared very late uh, in the habitation uh, time frame for Mesa Verde. Next. Uh, great angle, again, Cliff Palace. Um, um, note the, maybe this is Spruce Tree House. Yeah, we go. But look at the light coming through the T-shaped doorway. We're still not sure what, what those were. Uh, were they access to public spaces? Uh, you know, the Mesa Verde T-shaped door helps us to, to know if Mesa Verde and people are in other places, uh, we know it's a cultural trait that they brought all the way to Bears Ears, all the way to Canyons of the Ancients. Uh, so that particular door uh, is, is definitely an architectural um, signifying a cultural trait for Mesa Verde and peoples. Next. Cliff Palace. 200 rooms, the largest cliff dwelling in North America. Next. Oak Tree House uh, is available on backcountry tours. We'll be doing some backcountry tours this summer. Um, Everything is changing with, with the national parks. So be aware if you're planning on national parks visits this summer, you need reservations. And the reservations can only be made uh, two weeks, 14 days in advance. Mesa Verde will have an Oak Tree House tour, but it's a six hour, uh, I'm sorry, a six mile hike. So just, you know, some of these are a little more rigorous than others. And if you're doing it in July, uh, just, just be aware that. These backcountry tours are great, but they can be very rigorous. Next, uh, Peabody House. Okay, so this is now known as Square Tower House. Um, one of the things that has happened over time is the decision was made that no Mesa Verde site or ruin should have a person's name. It should have uh, some other kind of identifying name. Lucy Peabody, was one of the two women who worked very hard to get Mesa Verde into a park. She wanted it as a national park, but this is now known as Square Tower House. It's all stabilized and restored. And uh, one of my favorite, favorite uh, places to view from up above. Next, here we go. And these postcards are great because they're, as I say, these early ones are hand colored. Again, that Square Tower House. All right, look at that. Early lodging. <laughs> what, what? Yeah, th th that's fine. Go ahead. 
I got a I got a puppy in here. Um, look at that. Looks like something out of Africa. <laughs> that was some of the original uh, housing uh, lodging, which was right up on the top of uh, the mesa near Spruce Tree House. Next, there we go. And and so uh, luckily, all this is gone now. It's it's a more um, genuine experience. But there are buildings that are there that were built uh, in the 1930s, and they are now uh, within a National Register Historic District. Uh, the park has its own historic districts, in addition to, of course, the prehistory. Next. Spruce Tree Camp is gone, but uh, these photos are great because, yes, in the age of Model A's and Model T's, Getting to Mesa Verde was quite an adventure if you were coming from Michigan or Wisconsin. And uh, camps, auto camps, were all over the West, including Mancus, Colorado, at the base of, um, of Mesa Verde. They had an auto camp where you could camp for free up till, get this, up till, I don't know, seven years ago, eight, nine years ago. Uh, so Spruce Tree Camp was where you could bring your, your Model T or Model A. So there were little little camp cottages, uh, you know, a, a service station. All of this is pretty well gone now, um, but it was it was the beginning of tourism for national parks. This road <laughs> was quite a challenge, and we have a book in our series about just getting to Mesa Verde and how difficult it was. Next. Yeah, so this is called the Knife Edge Road. And when I do tours, we, we uh, come to not quite this far. The whole thing is gone. It's all sloughed off. And there are many, many stories about this road, um, including the fact that terrified Midwesterners abandoned their vehicles. They'd come around the corner and they would just freeze. And so eventually the Park Service had to put a phone near here and you would phone up a park ranger and have them drive your vehicle around the corner. And uh, this Manca Shale is highly loose. It moves all the time. So the current road and tunnel are uh, east of this. And this is closed, but you can, there's a great interpretive sign. And um, I've done enough tours. I've had all sorts of generations of folks uh, with me. And I had one uh, fellow who remembered when uh, he did this, I think he's in his late 70s, early 80s now, and his mother <laughs> hid under the, the dashboard, just didn't want to see. And he sat up and watched his dad drive uh, this road. So um, just getting to Mesa Verde is a great story unto itself. There we go. Sleeping Ute. Um, this is a view, uh, lots of great views in the park. And, and this is on the Ute Mountain Ute Tribal um, Reservation. There is a Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Park, which borders Mesa Verde to the south. And uh, we have Ute Mountain Ute members, Ernest House is on our board of directors. And uh, someday we will do an official Mesa Verde Foundation Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Park tour. I've been in there a lot. It is just stunning, and uh, far fewer, um, far fewer uh, visitors than Mesa Verde, but the same architecture. Next, all right. They got there via the railroad, the DNRG, uh, Denver and Rio Grande little um, narrow gauge railroad. Next. Oh, here we go. So. What's fun is not only do we have these postcards, we've got the back of the postcards. And so for people doing research, it's as fun to look at the front as it is to look at the back. So this is, uh, what is it? June 10th, 1919. And, uh, you know, here was a, a postcard from here and then mailed all the way out, uh, you know, out onto the Great Plains of Colorado. Next. There we're up to what, 1938, one cent. Uh, this postcard went to New Hampshire. Um, 
pretty darn interesting. And, and you know, our tourists have come from everywhere. Next. Um, so some of the sites are closed and that's why these backcountry tours are so important. Uh, I've never been to this one. I'd like to. Next. City of the Silent Dead is not a phrase that native peoples would want anybody to use now. Um, but these postcards uh, are there and, um, you know, that's that was how it was captioned um, more than a century ago. Next. Definitely worth visiting Cliff Palace. Next. Spruce Tree House. Notice the, the tourist regalia of the time. Uh, you needed jodhpurs and boots that almost came to your knees, um, supposedly to be safe from rattlesnakes, um, hey, I just wear, you know, much lower boots, but this was the, the clothing for adventurers. Next. Pretty interesting tower, the watchtower in Navajo Canyon. Some of these places you can see with binoculars. Uh, and again, why the towers and why, look at all the work and look at all the work that would have gone into putting those blocks there. Uh, on that rocky precipice. Next. Um, so we are now at um, Sun Temple, and this is very different masonry, very different design. These could have been Chacoan peoples who came to Mesa Verde. Uh, this is kind of a big riddle, and the interpretive signs when you're there uh, really, you know, really uh, help you to think about how this is so different from anything you've seen. And it was never finished. It never was roofed. Uh, what not to do. Um, what I teach are two rules of conservation. The first rule of conservation is never do to an artifact what cannot be undone. And that applies to your grandmother's quilt or uh, 1957 Chevy, uh, but it also applies to the ruins. And so it was not a good idea to put concrete on the top of Sun Temple. And because concrete can, when we have our, our freeze and thaw cycles, concrete is harder than the sandstone and it can damage the sandstone. So learning about that has also been part of the research at Mesa Verde. Now we use a much more different a bonding agent that flexes, uh, has some polymers in it, and uh, I think all that concrete has been chipped out. Next. Ah, we're getting to early Kodachromes, Ektachromes, Agfachromes. Um, yeah, the beginnings of color postcards with, with uh, original film. Pretty neat. Let's see. Uh oh, now this is this is really interesting. I, I don't I don't think this is a joke, but but look at the <laughs> so this is uh, let's see April uh, 1950 and read what it says. Dear dear Margaret, this morning they had to take Grandma's little toe off. Doctor Burnett thought she would be all right. Time will tell. Whoa! So here we are, an important you know email message or text message via postcard, um, you know, from more than a half a century ago. Okay, Andy, well, I'm enjoying um, all the postcard, postcards and of course your talk. Your postcards aren't the only vintage thing here. I have a vintage MacBook, and so I have to close out this slide presentation and open a second one. So bear with me, please. Sure, sure. So I hope our participants uh, return to Mesa Verde soon. Um, a lot of new interpretive signs in the park and uh, really great accommodations. And a uh, whole new thing just recently, 
uh, we've now got dark sky um, accreditation. Let me let my pup out just a second. <laughs> So yes, the International Dark Sky Association, um, the first dark sky park was Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah. And Mesa Verde has now achieved that status. And uh, I've got friends coming uh, next month actually, and we're gonna spend the night up in the park uh, just to see the stars um, and to see the same skies that the ancestral Puebloans saw. All right, we're going to load up the second half of the program here and finish it out. We'll have a few more postcards and then some color images of mine and uh, sort of bring us up to date. I look forward to I almost to have everything sorted. <laughs> Good. I look forward to any questions that, that folks have. I'm um, not sure I can answer them. I'm a historian. I'm not an archaeologist, um, but uh, it's great, as I say, working with my students at Fort Lewis College and uh, the stories they tell. Um, the internships we've arranged at Mesa Verde have, have been fabulous for them. All right, Andy, just bear with me for a moment. Sure. Longhouse will be open this summer uh, out on uh, Weatherill Mesa, that is an extraordinary site. If you've not been there, I would urge you to go there. Longhouse has turkey pens. There were turkey pens um, way high up. And uh, I've enjoyed um, taking folks there and actually uh, having artists there at uh, Longhouse. Mesa Verde is underpainted. And when I say that, I mean, compared to Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon, uh, there are few uh, paintings of Mesa Verde and, and the foundation has helped to change that. So here you go. This is the ladder you climb to get to the top uh, of Balcony House. And uh, um, Shannon, you've been up that ladder a couple times, I hope. I have. I, I won't lie, the first time I was a bit surprised <laughs> at the energy that I had to, to right. use to get up. But Right. Well, and, and, the, and uh, once you get started, just keep on going. Okay. That's Next. the trick. Yeah. Keep going. Next. There's probably a line of people behind you. <laughs> there are. Yes. All right. So. The view from the top now, that wall that I showed you in the historic postcard is still there. Uh, the cliffs are dramatic, just dramatic. Next. This is interesting. So pay, pay attention when you visit Mesa Verde to look at the walls. You've ob obviously you've got soot, but you've also got fire and um, Ritual abandonment is, is a, another great topic to talk about. Um, certainly Chaco Canyon was ritually abandoned. I think there were sites in Bears Ears and at Mesa Verde, where as people left, as the clans began to migrate out, uh, they, they burned kivas and they burned rooms. Next. That is a close up of the balcony at Balcony House. Notice the cedar beams uh, cut with stone axes. Notice the uh, material and the clay. Um, what we don't know, what I'm fascinated by is gender. What was women's work? What was men's work? Obviously everybody helped with the materials, but who did what work? And uh, there's some indication that women worked on roofs and I, I think they would have helped 
build this balcony. Ah, the secret of water, the sacredness of water, uh, big summer rain clouds, all the little, the Spanish word is tinajas, uh, little pools of water. Um, this is in the back country of Mesa Verde and it's so great when we see this. So here's a trail uh, to on the, one of the backcountry sites that the CCC's uh, teams actually, you know, have worked on, and it's pretty narrow. So definitely, if you've not done a backcountry tour, it's very different from um, the normal tours where you can just drive to the point and and uh, meet your ranger. So look at that site. So on the, you know, it's right against the cliff. Here we go, backcountry tour. Uh, this site has never been completely uh, stabilized. And so you can see a little work's been done. There's the wooden platform. Um, it's so amazing to think that we protected this park in 1906 and there's still work to do and carefully, slowly, it'll get done. Square Tower House, uh, great stop. And this one is easy to access because you stay on top, you walk a asphalt trail, and the next image is the view of what it looks like now. So we saw this in the postcards. We saw how these walls were really damaged over time, and now they're stable. And it's interesting, oh, okay. Um, it's interesting that the top tower there, uh, one of the pieces of research that hasn't yet fully been developed at Mesa Verde is archaeoastronomy. And are there sites that help us understand solstice events and the equinox? And I'm convinced that as tall as that was to make, there must be some archaeoastronomical connection to the top of that, that room block. Here we go, one of the long time, really great uh, Mesa Verde employees, National Park Service employees with his checkbook, making sure, you know, are the walls staying stable? Uh, what do we need to do to preserve this for another thousand years? So, one of the ways they do that, and I said the first rule of conservation is never due to an artifact what cannot be undone. The second rule of conservation is never do a repair to an artifact that cannot be reversed and never make a patch that is identical to the original texture. So on my great aunt's quilts, same thing. If we need to fix something on a quilt, we might find a similar kind of material, but not identical and not the same color. So that's what's happening here. These are little paint uh, patches and they're watching to see how uh, they change in the sun so that when they have to do plaster, they don't want somebody a hundred years from now thinking it's an original plaster. And so that little bit of color uh, on a modern treatment is important. Also look look up and there's a there's a Nordenschuld inscription Kiva one. Look at that from 1891 and it's still there. Uh, another great spot to be is up in the Logia, um, and uh, especially you know if it's hot and there's a lot of people around. This is a great place to just come and sit and look out across at Spruce Tree House. Now, this is an interesting image because um, we've had those great photographs we started off with by Mr. Bacon. But look at this and you'll see the reddish tint. From 1900 to 2000, we had lots of fires at Mesa Verde. It was just a really, really serious decade for fires. And we didn't fully understand what was being used in the fire retardant dropped by airplanes. 
and it had a color to it that the company said, oh, yeah, it'll wash off. Well, it wasn't that easy. Also, look straight up. So look into the middle of the image and look straight up and you see that little green bush right on the top of the ledge. Well, look, there's a little pour off there. And if you go around up just a little bit more and to the right, that is a water barrier. So that's to keep water from just rushing over the top of the ledge to, to uh, you know, bring it together so it'll go off farther and not drip back. So Spruce Tree House is now closed. There's been some issues with the lower part spalling off. And uh, we, as part of the Mesa Verde Foundation, have raised funds to help with the research. That whole lower ledge needs to be pinned. And uh, I think the, the engineering has been done. I'm not sure the work has been done yet. So you can see Spruce Tree House now, but you can't go down into it yet. But we're still talking about that fire retardant. Go to the next image, please. Yeah, and so you see that orangish rock. Next. So this is a problem. So in order to stop those fires, they used an aerial fire retardant. It actually sped up, accelerated spalling on some of those stones. And we were not aware of that. So again, part of the research of Mesa Verde is to come up, and I think this has happened, with a fire retardant that A, doesn't last as long, and B, uh, does its job, but doesn't damage uh, remote archeological sites. Oh, Florence Lister was so fun to work with. Uh, all of her books are great. Um, she, she did just, she was a great interpreter. Uh, her husband, um, uh, helped start archaeology at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, a Harvard uh, graduate, and uh, she was just just great to to work with on tours. Bill Sagstetter, uh, another uh, uh, I won't call him an amateur. He wasn't a professional archaeologist. He was an extraordinary adventurer. Uh, here he is in a room at Holenweep. And uh, one of his books that, that I really, really like is called The Cliff Dwelling Speak. And uh, it's a really well illustrated and it helps us understand uh, the ancestral Puebloans. And it includes lots of images from early Smithsonian uh, materials that are reproduced. So it's just full of drawings and designs and, and uh, just very useful. So Hovenweep, the Mesa Verde world, uh, extends from the park to Hovenweep National Monument. And look at that, perfect 90 degree angle, uh, 800 years later. So much to think about in terms of the ancestral Puebloans, in terms of working with a younger generation today and uh, for interpretation and, and just, you know, how can we help cooperative native peoples who are, when I say cooperative, I, meant, I mean um, specifically engaged with the park that have chosen to you know, say, look, we have this cultural affiliation. How can we work on that and, and do a better job? And uh, I think that's just such a great challenge uh, coming forward. So this is a pretty neat uh, this is called Treehouse. This is in Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Park. Um, it's great. I've worked on the trail system in here um, and been in here when it started to rain and the roads get worthless. So they're sand and uh, just a few drops. And if you're down in the bottom here, boom, it's time to go. Chimney Rock, uh, uh, President Obama National Monument that stayed with the Forest Service. Uh, I mentioned this earlier in my talk, how the moon actually oscillates up and down between these in, um, in a 17.6 year cycle. So put that on your calendars. Uh, you want to be here in, uh, when that lunar event happens again. It happens around the world, but very rarely. And this is one of those spots. 
Um, things are changing because of the virus. So this sort of thing won't be happening where you, you know, line up for your tour, wait for the ranger. Uh, instead, I think the pattern this summer is going to be the ranger will be there and you come down to the tour uh, and it'll be a timed entrance like it has in the past, but um, there'll be a lot more motion. But it'll be there, Cliff Palace, come back. Um, it's always exciting to see it again. One of the things I really enjoy doing is tours for uh, native students. These are Hopi eighth graders, and uh, we took them to Canyons of the Ancients, uh, as well as a Mesa Verde tour. I got to work with Susan Sakakaku uh, uh, on a Smithsonian river trip, and uh, just had a lot of fun with her. She is back uh, on at Hopi, uh, having worked at the Smithsonian, and just really interested in helping a younger generation understand their heritage. Spruce Tree House, a kiva that you can't get into, but there are kivas and kiva ladders that you used to be able to go down into and hopefully we'll be able to do it again. All right, so Monica, let's open it up for questions. Okay, well, thank you, Andy. That was just exceptional. I'm so excited for Mesa Verde now. You have no idea. I want to like pack my bags and just get on to the next flight out to Colorado. <laughs> so thank you for just, you know, creating that buzz all over again. I mean, so informative. Um, I have a few questions, but I don't want to take up all the time for our participants. So if anyone has questions, please drop it into the chat box and um, I promise we'll try and get to all of them. So um, please, uh, any questions or comments? So someone actually already posted something in the question and answer session that was not in the chat box. So I'm just gonna read it because it's funny. Gwendolyn said that she noticed on the postcard about grandma losing her toe that it was dated April 1st. So perhaps it was an April Fool's joke. Very, <laughs> very observant. I wondered if somebody was going to catch that. That's actually a really great question from a colleague of mine, Dr. Saul. She works at the New York State Museum. So of course, she's the one that caught that on April Fool's. <laughs> well, she has a great sense of humor, too. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? It's not very often that you'll have an expert like Dr. Gulliford available to take your questions. And it's one of the really exciting things about what we're doing with this webinar series. Andy, I have a question while we're waiting for some to come in. Do you know when the next lunar event will happen at Chimney Rock? Uh, do you have your day planner ready to go? Are you gonna, are you gonna? Absolutely, I plan in advance. Oh boy, I think uh, mm, nine more years, something like that. Okay, well, I'll we'll, mark it. Mark uh, we, it down. <laughs> we have a question from um, SJ. How many cave dwellings in total are in the park? Um, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to answer that because it would depend on the size. Uh, I think the key word there is dwelling because there are many granaries, uh, little uh, small uh, uh, granaries. I would say, boy, I, you know, maybe, maybe 60. But, um, um, Shannon, if you'll write that down, we'll, let's try and and, and get an answer to that. But the key is dwelling because there are other structures that are there that were not habitation sites. That's a great question from Stephen. Um, now another one, why and when was the use of the word Anasazi eliminated? Um, well, th this is, uh, is gonna take a while to answer. Uh, the word has not been eliminated by the Navajos. So as I, as I work on my, on my Bears Ears book, 
um, they are still using Anasazi. It is a Navajo word. The translation of it is what's important. So it, it translates as, and, and if you don't get the possessive on the comma right, you get it all wrong. People thought that it said enemy ancestor. Well, how can your ancestor be your enemy? And I had a Navajo student explain to me, no, 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 it's enemy possessive. So enemy's ancestor, meaning that the, that the ancestral Puebloans and the Puebloans were the enemy of the Navajos, which over time, things like that happen. But because it's a Navajo word, the, um, the rangers uh, don't use it. And it's definitely going out of uh, fashion in, at, uh, for books and, and uh, interpretive signs. But other people would say, wait a minute, at this point, the word itself is historic. It's, it's been used for over 100 years. And they would also say that the word Puebloan is Spanish. So this will continue, I think, to be a question. Uh, there are many tribes, many, many clans, uh, many languages. Um, so at this point, the agreed upon terminology is ancestral Puebloan. Navajo scholars uh, want to say that there were Navajos at the same time there were ancestral Puebloans. Archaeologists aren't too sure about that. So this is part of the ongoing dialogue in the four corners. Not only when were people in certain locations, but what did they call each other and what should we call them now? Wow, thank you, Andy. That could be a whole webinar topic in of itself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there's just so much involved. Um, this one is from David Nagler. How many undiscovered sites have you explored? <laughs> well, D David, we will, we will have to answer that in your airplane. And, and when we're high above uh, uh, Bears Ears or the Four Corners, um, we'll, uh, we'll definitely uh, get to that question. But one answer is I was able to find a site in Bears Ears a couple weeks ago that I'd been in 15 years before. And uh, I lost it, couldn't remember exactly where it was. Spent all day on a Saturday trying to get to it, got cliffed out. Um, couldn't, couldn't go any further, had to go climb up this cliff and luckily found a little pile of stones. Somebody else had been in the same dilemma, reached up and there was a root there and it was still attached. It wasn't rotten. But then the problem was lifting my 53 pound dog over my head to get up on this ledge, uh, missed the site, found it the next day. It has no name. It's not on Google. Nobody knows where it is. It's extraordinary. So yes, there are, um, I would say probably most of the sites have been discovered, but there are many that are unvisited where there are no trails to them. And so that is a great part of the Four Corners, a great part of the Mesa Verde world is that sense of personal discovery. Okay, wonderful. Um, this is a question from John. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, John. John Satoff. Which tribes have been most helpful in understanding the movement of the Puebloans? Um, the Puebloans themselves. So um, that means everybody uh, at Hopi, at Zuni, and then all the real Grand Pueblos. So Taos all the way down to Zia. Um, and, and those are the folks who can claim, you know, direct uh, ancestral ties to Mesa Verde. And they can read the rock art. They can understand the paintings. Um, when we have our Mesa Verde tour, uh, Chris Lewis as a Zuni basket maker, Chris is the first person in another 800 years to make a certain kind of Mesa Verde basket. So uh, what I love about history and heritage and culture is how do we protect it? How do we preserve it? How do we replicate it for younger generations? And that's why these consultations at Mesa Verde are so important uh, with the Pueblo people. 
Um, we just have also a few more comments. Um, Bill Wade has um, an image of Willa Cather visiting Cliff Palace in 1915. We don't have the capability to share your photo, Bill, with the viewers right now, but I'm sure if you'd like to email it to Andy, I'll put his email in the chat box and you guys can have a discussion on that. Um, just to wait, 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 let me, uh, let me say hi to Mr. Wade. The Wade family uh, has a long, deep, very important Mesa Verde history. Um, they were rangers there and through different generations. And uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, he's on the, the webinar uh, at the Center of Southwest Studies. We were honored to receive from the Wade family a very rare collection of Navajo baskets that uh, the Wades had acquired. And so um, glad, glad you're out there, Bill. Love to see that photo. Yes, um, Jan Wright, we touched upon your question. Um, Andy mentioned that the the moon event at Chimney Rock will occur in nine years, roughly. So, um, <laughs> so somebody, should, somebody should just Google that. Uh, the, the lunar standstill at Chimney Rock and then be prepared to have all sorts of uh, highly technical um, equipment and cameras. And But it is amazing. And uh, I think there's something like that in Peru. But uh, you can either come here or go to Peru. I'd, I'd come here. Yes, um, this one is a comment from Alan Peterson from um, Museum of Northern Arizona. Hi, Andy, it's good to see you. Great presentation. I just want to say that in my own research and in cataloging the paintings of Gunnar Woodforce, vintage postcards have been invaluable resources for identifying and verifying locations where he painted. And as you pointed out, great for identifying changes in the subjects. Postcards are, are underappreciated. And um, uh, people love, we've got a, a book called Southwest Sampler that I edited that has postcards of uh, Durango, Telluride, Ure, Silverton, and people love it. And so absolutely, uh, thank you. It does, they definitely have research potential. All right, and let's see, we have a question from Doug Bacon. You alluded to the unknown nature of the towers. What is your theory? Um, first off, they, they seem to have something to do with water and water sources. Uh, certainly they do in the Bears Ears area. Uh, Cave Towers is a really important site where there are seven or eight towers on the same cliff ledge. They seem to be protecting a spring. Uh, drought was one of the reasons the Mesa Verdeans left. Um, so there's, they have something to do with, with uh, the end of the era, so probably 1200 to 1300. They have something to do with springs and also some kind of communication um, and, and cer certainly line of sight communication. Um, so Mesa Verde, the Mancus River, uh, ca the canyons of Mesa Verde drop into the Mancus River. And William Henry Jackson photographed some of the first towers along the river. They're still there today in Ute Mountain New Tribal Park. Um, and I, I suggest that Mr. Bacon uh, photograph every one of them. Yes, right. <laughs> Well, I think this concludes it for um, questions and comments. If anyone has any further remarks they would like to say before we log off in the next minute, please quickly type it away. Otherwise, we'll conclude. And uh, I just want to thank you all again for tuning in. And of course, so much gratitude to you, Andy. And um, I'll let you close with final remarks. Uh, just thank you for taking your afternoon. Uh, maybe it's evening wherever you are, but um, we are honored as the Mesa Verde Foundation to work with the park. And uh, you please communicate with Shannon if you have other questions or uh, would like to consider some kind of a donation, but also come visit again. It is beautiful. And uh, as I say, the research is definitely ongoing.